From life came man, joining the caravan for the long, slow journey through a world of discovery, invention, exploration. His marks, his milestones, stretch out through the centuries. His footsteps echo down through the corridors of time. Time, July 1969 in Florida. The footsteps, the caravan quickened. The corridors shortened as man reached outside his world into another void. taking only a sideways glance at the reminders of that milestone. Reminders, images that vaguely jog our memory. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We're aiming toward a planned liftoff time of 32 minutes past the hour. The start of our launch window on this the mission to land men on the moon. The countdown still proceeding very satisfactorily at this time. Time, time it plays tricks on us. It smudges and blurs the sharp edges of reality. But we turn the trick and summon up our own reality, images, sounds, to help us remember. The batteries all look good. The next time we go internal will be at the 50 second mark with those batteries, and they will remain, of course, on internal power during the flight. The little module, which has been rather inactive during these phases of the count, also is going on internal power at this time on the two batteries in the ascent stage and the four batteries in the descent stage. They came, one We're million of them, for, uh, to this place, drawn by the magnet of history in the making. The astronauts, the prime crew, were awakened at 4.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight and proceeded to uh, have a physical examination in which they were declared flight ready. They sat down for the normal astronaut fair on lunch day as far as breakfast is concerned, orange juice, steak, scrambled eggs, toast, and coffee. The target for the Apollo 11 astronauts, the moon at liftoff, will be at a distance of 218,096 miles away. The astronauts departed from their crew quarters uh, after checking out their suits. They departed from the crew quarters at 6.27 a.m. and some 27 minutes later, eight miles away from the crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center, atop the launch pad at Complex 39, 6.54 a.m., the commander, astronaut Neil Armstrong, was the first to board the spacecraft. He was uh, followed about five minutes later by Mike Collins, and finally Buzz Aldrin, the man who's sitting in the middle seat during liftoff, was the third astronaut to come aboard. The weather is uh, certainly go. It's a beautiful morning for a launch to the moon. We expect a temperature of about 85 degrees in the Kennedy Space Center area. We're still go on Apollo 11 at this time. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared.
The Eagle has landed. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for man. Apollo 11. Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. They and millions of others reached out and, in their own way, touched another planet. The images remind us that it happened, but not how it really was in the context of the times. George Lowe, one of the architects of the Apollo program, does If you think back at the, the period of the 60s, they weren't very happy years in general. We had, uh, well, the ever-deepening involvement in Vietnam. We had uh, riots on the campuses, riots in Washington elsewhere, three terrible assassinations. A great deal of, of strife and turmoil in the country. And yet all of this was overcome by one single event, and that was Apollo 11. Uh, the decade ended with it. It was a fantastic adventure that I believe helped overcome all of the bad things of the decade. It uh, uh, represented Americans to ourselves and particularly to the rest of the world as we like to see ourselves and as we hope the rest of the world likes to see us. Some of it is now in museums, artifacts from an age of discovery. These strange looking objects, they're there as reminders that after all, it did happen. And it happened the way we remember. The facilities of Apollo, now silent and still. In Houston, mission control, the nerve center of manned flight operations. The chapters of space history, First Mercury, then Gemini, then Apollo, were written by the people who sat at these consoles. And these chapters of history came at us with breakneck speed. Christmas Eve, 1968, in the beginning, Apollo 8, the footsteps were quickening. A few months later, Apollo 9, the long years of preparation were contracting into days, hours, minutes the first manned flight of the lunar module, the Spider. Apollo 10, the dress rehearsal for the real thing. In five months, three missions, and in the seventh month, the payoff. Then, the celebrations. Images and the sounds fade in our memories, but some things we can't forget. Names, Apollo 11, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. Other names, Grissom, White, and Chaffee. They remind us that it wasn't all success and celebration. There was failure and tragedy. Early in 1967, the three crawled into the command module at Cape Kennedy for a test. There was a flash fire. All three died. After the shock came the long, painful job of picking up the pieces, learning the lessons, coming together for a common goal. 
the remains of the launch structure stand as a reminder that the goal was reached. These strange shapes, what do they mean? These towers of steel, what are they? Monuments or leftovers from some earlier age of discovery? In the long history of man, in the slow journey of the caravan, what point do these mark? Historian Arthur Schlesinger, I have no doubt at all that if posterity remembers the 20th century for anything, historians 500 years from now looking at the 20th century, it will be because it will be the century when man first began to break his terrestrial bonds and began the exploration of space. So that's it. As man learned, moved on, and discarded the earlier structures, he came to these. They are marked for further milestones, reserved for future missions, other reaches to other different voids. Historians five centuries from now will mark this century, this place, and they will further note that from the void, life, man, it took eons to reach this point. But once there, the centuries and years compressed into days, hours, split seconds of exploration. engine, the airplane, they came slowly at first, then with increasing velocity. And then this, so huge, so powerful, so different that no ordinary modern name would suffice. They reached backward through antiquity to Roman mythology and they named it Saturn. Saturn. His father was heaven, his mother earth. organization, the mammoth machines, the incredibly detailed technical knowledge, the dedication. It was all harnessed, sharpened to a fine edge and focused. The program developed and matured. Apollo 17 was launched at night and even the old hands, the hardened veterans of the space program, couldn't help but feel the awe and wonder and excitement. the excitement of the split second of exploration, man doesn't stop to freeze the moment in history, to look at it and ask what it means. He simply lives it out. But in the Apollo program, on their way to the moon, they found a way to live out their strange moments in those strange spacecraft. It may be the peculiar nature of Americans to make history and to have fun in the making. had fun because they, we, were confident of success. But the program teaches lessons. Confidence is a transitory thing. Apollo 13. Hey, Houston, we've had a problem here. Can say again, please? Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. 
Stand by, 13. We're looking at it. Three days out, barreling toward the moon, an explosion. No one would see the problem for some time, but they went to work on it. The people of Apollo coalesced into a single dedicated unit, linked themselves with their technology, and cheated tragedy. A new chapter in space history was written in Mission Control. Eugene Krantz was the flight director when the problem developed. Uh, throughout this entire uh, next several days, there was one dominant thought uh, in the minds of all of the uh, flight controllers. Uh, we teach them that, that between God, country, and your own capability, uh, that you can solve any problem that may occur in flight. Uh, throughout the entire course of Apollo 13, there was never any doubt that we'd get the crew back. So there was a very positive approach, and with this kind of approach, uh, you can solve just about any problem that comes up. Solve any problem, country, capability, old-fashioned words during a time when some said the old-fashioned virtues were forgotten. Well, they weren't forgotten. They were translated into action, into programs which took man soaring above the surface of the moon, away from Earth, but always looking back on it. These divided thoughts, the moon, the Earth, run through the Apollo program a sort of theme. They went there flying in their graceful machines, but they always thought back to where they came from. Perhaps that's natural. The moon is a strange place for men to be flying to. If it's strange for men, for mankind, it's stranger still for the individual man. Harrison Schmidt, Dr. Harrison Schmidt, a geologist, he touched the moon and remembers how it was when Apollo 17 was making its descent, the last flight to the moon, the last time that man walked on its surface. Schmidt remembers how it was. One's first feelings are a mixture, a very complex mixture of humility, of excitement because of something you had planned to do was being accomplished, but of a great attention to detail, to, do, to the detail that you had thought about and learned about for so many years prior to the actual event. That detail keeps you occupied with where your hands are and where your feet are, which rung they might be. You try to remember, well, am I at the bottom of the rung? And then as one moves away and tests his way on the surface of the moon and looks around, and in my case, looked around a very magnificent valley, you see a rolling, hilly country that is interspersed with some blocky fields of rocks that you know because you've studied the photographs, and you saw them as you descended surround large craters that have been formed in that rolling countryside. These rolling dark hills merge in the distance a few kilometers away with the very smooth but very bright colored slopes of the massifs. And they rise with a majesty to rocky tops that are almost beyond description because there's nothing like it that we have seen on Earth. The Sea of Tranquility, Hadley Rill, Taurus Littrow. They were once strange names on the map of the moon, but the men of Apollo gave reality to the names by being there and showing us the places. 
They explored 60 miles of its surface, and their travels took them to craters, foothills, to explore, to observe, and to sample. Hard rock proof of Apollo, enshrined in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., 478.8 grams of microbreccia, under glass for mere earthlings to see and whisper about. Other rocks from the moon, 840 pounds, are being studied and talked about by scientists in laboratories around the world. Not only rocks, tens of thousands of photographs of those strange, exotic features of the moon. And telemetry, data on tape, facts, figures. The studies will go on for years, and the answers will come slowly, answers to questions about the moon and the solar system. The science of Apollo is not merely concerned with samples from past milestones, yesterday's missions. In a special room in Houston, men sit at consoles and command instruments on the moon to send them today's data. And they receive it today within eight seconds of the command. Science, that's the key. And technology, and something else. In the drama of the moment, few stop to think of the essential element, the one thing that made it happen. People came to this program, government people, university people, contractor people. They brought to Apollo skills and knowledge and determination. This source of human intellectual energy was marshaled, focused, challenged. What came out of the effort was not just a very successful program, but a rich national resource of vast proportions. Crystals from the moon, the symbols of the science of Apollo. Behind it, causing it, was the spirit of Apollo. I was strolling on the moon one day. In a merry, merry month of December. Now, May. May. May is the month. May, that's right. <laughs> May is the year of the month. When then, much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. Do -do 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 -do. That's the truth. You do that in West Texas and you get a... We saw something of this spirit. We shared in the adventure, the excitement, the euphoria of being there. We shared it with the men who bounced across the surface of the moon. Look at the size of that biggie. It is a biggie, isn't it? And the surprise of discovery. We were there too, all of us, watching vicarious explorers. Okay, we're headed that way. You get the tongs, uh, John? Yep, we are. I'm carrying the rake. Look at the size of that rock. Can't believe Got it. I can't either. Let's go on back. I am. And the meaning, the significance of an occasion, that too came to us, flashed into our living rooms on our 19-inch window on the universe. We hope that this will be a symbol of what our feelings are, what the feelings of the Apollo program are, and a symbol of mankind that we can live in peace and harmony in the future. There was also pride. They put up the flag and then posed for pictures as any visitor to a foreign place might do. The flag of each mission stood there as a reminder that we had been there, but there was the realization that in truth, it belonged to all the people. There are no boundaries on the moon. The focus was the moon. That's what it was all about. But by reaching up there, we, in a sense, came back here. As one stands and scans a 360-degree panorama of his own, one of the first objects in the dark lunar sky that you see is a bright and beautiful bluish globe that we call Earth. This globe represented to all of us, I think, not only home, but a very fragile place that we have come back and felt that needed not only protection, but understanding.
They first went there in 1969. They last left there in late 1972. Between the beginning and the conclusion, they came to feel, to dimly perceive what it was all about, to come to a perspective on the meaning of it all. Poet Archibald MacLeish has said it better than most. To see the earth as it truly is, small and blue and beautiful, in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as riders on the earth together, brothers who know now they are truly brothers. The excitement of the mission, the tension and drama of the splashdown, they remain only in our memories and in time they'll be replaced in the future by other missions, other memories. The moments of Apollo may be over, but the understanding and the discovery, they go on. And the full meaning, the real meaning, may yet be in the future too. But for now, for the present, the images and the sounds provide meaning enough to each in his own way and to each in his own time.